Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, my name is David Berto. I am the Senior Vice President and the Director of the International Security Program here. I also have the privilege of heading up our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group, and I'll be your moderator uh, this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, it's a lot cooler here than it is uh, outside. Um, I was looking at a, uh, an event we had actually three years ago this day, not this date, but the, the, uh, the third Friday in, uh, in July. And uh, it was right after a hurricane had come through and wiped out the power. And this room was about 130 degrees. And it was by far the shortest webcast event we've ever had at CSIS. We rushed through the slides. There were zero questions from the audience, and we were done. Today, though, we're in no hurry to leave because it's not uh, worse uh, here than it is upstairs. Um, I want to also, uh, a couple of administrative details. Uh, those of you in the room, please silence your uh, cell phones or other, other devices. I'd like to welcome our viewers on the web. We have, uh, uh, we have an increasing number of, uh, of web viewers. And I suspect on Friday, I should offer a particular uh, welcome to our furloughed uh, viewers. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, uh, and we're hopeful that you'll get something useful out of here that will in no way violate the terms and conditions of your, of your furlough. So, so uh, in all seriousness, I think we, uh, we owe uh, a great deal of respect and gratitude to all our civilian employees in the defense business who are sticking this out. And, and I want to express my gratitude to all of you, uh, uh, whether you're furloughed today or, or not. Uh, this is uh, an event that's associated with the Ground Forces Dialogue. And it's really the first uh, visible public uh, collaboration that we've had between uh, the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group and the International Security Program and the Ground Forces Dialogue, which is operating under uh, generous uh, uh, sponsorship and support from uh, uh, Northrop Grumman and BAE Systems. Uh, Marin Lead, who is a senior fellow in, in the Brown Chair uh, here at CSIS, runs that Ground Forces Dialogue. This is a little bit of a tangent, because we're obviously talking about a lot more than just Ground Forces today, but it's brought up some of the issues, if you will. I intend to provide a few introductory comments, and then we have an excellent uh, panel with us here today uh, who each have some presentations to make, some with slides, some just the oral presentations. Um, then I'm going to ask a couple of questions, exercising the moderator's uh, uh, prerogative to, uh, to ask a question or two. And then our plan is to open it up to questions both here from the audience uh, and from our, our viewers. Um, if you're here in the room, we'll be doing our normal question process. You raise your hand, identify yourself, we'll bring you a microphone. Actually, you wait until you get the microphone before you identify yourself. We don't require you to identify yourself before we give you the microphone. Um, and then you'll uh, have the opportunity to ask your question and we'll let the panel comment. For those of you uh, who are watching on the web, I'll give you my email address and you can send in uh, questions by, uh, by email when we get to the end. There are a host of reasons uh, why it's in the U.S. government's interest and the Defense Department's interest to promote and, uh, and create a, a good opportunity to actualize uh, foreign sales, uh, military sales, either foreign military sales or, or foreign direct sales. Um, it's a way of promoting uh, our national interests and our national security interests all around the world. It's a way of fostering relationships with allies and partners. It's a way of enhancing technology and technology exchanges. It's a way of increasing interoperability and, and, uh, and both tactical and operational uh, capability as well as strategic value. Um, and of course, it also has the uh, added benefit of providing an additional business base for defense companies uh, on whom our nation depends for national security. So we're looking at, uh, at more the industry side of this today, but clearly this conversation fits inside a, a much broader context. You see examples of that across the board in, in the Defense Department. Uh, uh, when CSIS released its report about a year ago on uh, uh, the force posture options with respect to the strategic rebalancing in Asia, a prominent element of those recommendations was a better job of organizing and rationalizing military sales so that it would be consistent with our long-term and developing interests in the region. Um, at the other end of that spectrum, when, uh, when uh, Frank Kendall and, and Dr. Ash Carter were here in this 
room uh, back at the end of May laying out a status report on the Better Buying Power Initiatives 2.0. One of those initiatives, of course, is designing for exportability. And there's active work underway inside DOD today uh, to implement uh, that initiative and to move forward on a, a near-term timetable to, uh, to come up with some solutions internally that would, in fact, help DOD support uh, design for exportability. And I know industry has a lot of interest in there. So there's a much broader spectrum of, of concerns and issues that, uh, that this fits inside. And we're committed to continuing that discussion and dialogue going forward. Today's focus, though, is a little more narrow, uh, and that is really on not so much just industry perspectives, but the perspectives of a number of people in looking at the industry role here, if you will. And, uh, and joining us, we have three outstanding uh, panelists to uh, both uh, uh, provide some insight and input to us and to provoke some discussion and some exchange amongst themselves and with all of you here in the room. Uh, first is John Barney. He is a partner at Avacent. He's going to provide an overview. Uh, and he does uh, have some charts, uh, and they're very good ones. Um, I, I believe these charts are available to you if you're watching on the web. There should be a PDF file that you can download. For those of you in the room, we'll be posting uh, both the video record and the audio record of this, uh, of this event. And we'll be posting the, the, the charts as well so that you can download them uh, yourself uh, and, uh, uh, um, as you can need them. Um, Following John will be uh, David Scruggs. David is a co-founder and managing partner of Renaissance Strategic Advisors and, of course, a, f a former uh, deputy director of our own Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here at CSIS and a senior fellow here. And then finally, Lieutenant General Jim Lovelace, who is a uh, uh, U.S. Army retired, uh, now corporate vice president uh, for international programs at L3 Communications. Um, and and uh, as I said, I'll open up after they've covered theirs uh, with a couple of questions of my own, and then uh, so you can be thinking about your own between now and then. Um, with that, uh, let me uh, turn to you, John, and let you start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, you thank you, David and CSIS and everyone for coming on this 110 degree day in Washington on a Friday. So it's a pretty good turnout, I think, showing the timeliness of the topic. So first of all, as a consultant, I thought it was you know, required to have a few slides um, just you know, to entertain you. But uh, there's actually a reason for them. You know, we, I want to share first some of the findings. Like we've had just our observations talking kind of senior aerospace and defense executives around kind of international markets over the last you know, several years. Second is we recently did a survey with aerospace and defense leaders on their perceptions of international markets and offsets. Then third is we've done, with our Avacent analytics capability, we've looked at um, the size of the global offset markets and a lot of the budget trends in certain markets. So we wanted to share some of those findings with you besides talking more broadly. So please you know, enjoy a couple of slides, and I promise they won't be too painful at all. <laughs> So first of all, just to get a sense, among the audience here, how many are in industry? Okay. So I think this will probably resonate with a lot of you who are in industry. You know, over the last several years, um, certainly as U.S. budgets are going down, Europe is going down, there's been a lot more focus on international markets. Um, one data point that we just recently had from a survey we did among executives uh, was that 93% of executives think, in the A&D sector, think that international is going to be more important in the next several years. Um, you can see this from the statements that CEOs are making at every major company. These are public statements, so certainly can be shared, that are you know, being said to analysts. But it's true that just about every major A&D company that international market expansion, growth is really going to be a focus. Now, I'm always a little cautious when you hear somebody saying they're going to grow their percentage of international business because one way you can do that is, of course, have the domestic go down enough that international will, by definition, grow at a percentage basis. But you're, you see that a lot. You can see this in terms of statements. You can see this in real time. If, you've made a, if anyone has been to AUSA versus IDEX a couple months ago, the contrast, you know, this, how forlorn everyone was at AUSA, and then when you go to IDEX, in Abu Dhabi, deals are getting done, people are excited. So you just see that contrast in the energy around international expansion. And the reason, I'm not going to go into a budget discussion here, but you know, despite, while there is a lot of hype around it, the numbers are actually pretty significant. You know, the, on the left, of course, is the U.S. budget forecast, just our version of it, which I think is certainly known and understood. Um, on the right, you see just a forecast we did around international markets and where we think the growth is. And the numbers, based on that, you know, we see at least it could be $100 billion in growth potential over the next several years in a number of international markets. So while there is a lot of hype, while not 
the growth internationally won't be enough to necessarily offset the U.S. decline or European decline. There is real opportunity there. And this may look a little frightening with, with a lot of dots, but I'll just, there's a couple of key points I just want to make on it, is that there's uneven opportunities around the world. So if you take, kind of take that point from there. So you've got, in the left, you've got markets that are established. You've got Europe and Canada and markets that are large, but they're going to be stagnant. They're not going to be growing over the next several years. Some are going to be in decline. Again, probably not a surprise. Germany, France, Japan. Then you've got, we're calling the major markets where every major aerospace and defense company is spending time, money, resources. These are India, Korea, Saudi Arabia, um, Brazil, um, and there's investment, there's people flying there, there's attempts to meet local partners in all these markets. So this is where pretty much every major aerospace and de defense company will have one of the markets in the major category as a priority. I'm um, not saying exclusively, but many of them will. And then finally, um, the third category, which breaks out are, are minor markets. And I don't, I'm not using the word minor to be negative. Um, some of these are obviously strategically important markets, but in terms of overall spend, um, I think on a, relative to the major markets, they're gonna be a little bit smaller over the next couple of years. And what you find with companies is in these smaller markets, there tends to be few companies that are pursuing them all aggressively, but what you're likely to see is companies having a plan where they'll address all the major markets, then a couple of the minor markets based on their, their products, based on the right reps they have in country, based on other strategic reasons. But if you think about the world, you know, you've got an overall story of growth, like I showed you previously, and then you've got kind of a mix with the European markets, not surprisingly stagnant, everyone investing in these markets that are poised to grow and also have scale. Then you've got this pretty mixed environment below that where there's a lot that could be growing, but from a pretty small base. So just I would take from there, it's, it's gonna be fairly uneven. Then, who's familiar with the term BRICS here? So, it's a little tricky in the A and D sector to use BRICS because you have Russia and China. So it's a, a little more complicated. <laughs> so when we did our survey, an interesting finding came out of it. We're calling it the busy markets, B-U-S-I. We asked the question in our survey to aerospace and defense leaders, what markets are most important to you? And four of them came out quite a, quite a lot higher than any other one. So it's Brazil, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and India. And you can see the flags here. Um, those four represent considerably more interest than any, any other. Then you have Korea, Canada, and Turkey all coming in as markets of other importance. But, I, but we put that up there to show that you know, everyone, if you're sitting in a strategic planning meeting, an international meeting, a you know, global strategy meeting, those markets come up, and repeatedly it's busy markets. Now, we can have a BRICS discussion another time because that adds a little level of complexity, but think of it as the busy markets. <laughs> Now, getting to a topic called offsets, um, which ends up being tightly related to global expansion and is an area of challenge for pretty much every major aerospace and defense company these days, and there's a couple of reasons. I, I won't get into a long dissertation on offsets, but simply, if you're not familiar with them, essentially, when a sale of a defense product is done in a certain market, a company will incur an offset, which is essentially a form of economic development, ideally, into that country. It could be tech transfer, it could be training, it can be manufacturing capability, export potential, Potential, any kind of capability to help that country develop economically. However, over the years, companies have kind of ignored this. Regulations haven't been enforced. It's changing for a couple of reasons. First of all, the numbers on sales are getting bigger. Then second, countries are becoming more sophisticated. So this is becoming an issue for every single major company right now as they try to expand internationally. It's the offset challenge. And we went out and we sized the market on this to see how big the problem actually is because the data doesn't really exist. Commerce has some data that's backward looking, but in terms of forward looking, there really isn't much data out there. So we actually sized the global offset market. And it turns out by 2017, there's gonna be close to a half trillion dollars in offset obligations for the aerospace and defense sector. So big numbers for the whole sector. And you know, The Economist is writing about it now as well, so it's getting visibility. And we put it out there because not only are the numbers big, but they're getting bigger faster. So when you see growth internationally, it means this challenge around offsets is getting bigger and bigger. It's much like 
you know, if you have an hourglass with the sand in it, where it's been kind of steady state with sand going through it, and all of a sudden you have a dump truck pouring sand into the hourglass, and you can't discharge obligations fast enough. So as companies are trying to grow globally, they're struggling every time to come up with an offset project, finding the right offset partners. So when you think companies developing the right strategy, offsets invariably is linked to that strategy. I'm just going to touch briefly that it's affecting every market, which ties in closely with where growth is taking place. Offsets are in every market. So in Middle East, it's driven by the Saudi Arabia and the UAE. In Asia Pacific, it's India and uh, Korea. In Latin America, it's Brazil. And then in Europe, Canada, Canada's driving it. So this is something that's affecting every company and every major market. Finally, uh, this ties in some of the data we have on analyzing the offset market plus um, the survey we did. And an interesting finding and also I think somewhat challenging finding is that the, the countries that have the biggest opportunities in terms of dollars, so like India, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, also are the ones that um, a and D executives are viewing as the most challenging to do business in. So in a perfect world, if you look in the upper right of the quadrant, that's always the good place on, on a chart. There's not much there. But if you look on the left, you've got big markets with big challenges. Um, and then you have Greece in the lower left. <laughs> so just to wrap up, so what does this all mean? So just five key points I just want to take away is in terms of the challenges and then some high-level recommendations. First, the way aerospace and defense companies have typically been operating, this is particularly true for the US, um, less so for Europe, is that there's been a fly-in, fly-out approach to international expansion. So while there's all this talk about global expansion, there's still an approach largely of the you know, US companies in particular flying in and then leaving. And the customers on the ground notice that. So a recommendation is boots on the ground and an understanding of who to partner with regarding joint ventures. Um, one somewhat anecdote I've heard from more than one company is the typical approach to finding a joint venture partner is, you know, you meet somebody in the Admiral's Club while flying, you know, on American Airlines, and then that's your JV partner. There really isn't a real strategic approach to finding partners. Second, uh, I think this gets to how to sell internationally. While it's important to sell products, having a solutions-centric approach, I think, can go a long way in actually understanding what the customer needs as opposed to just selling what's in your portfolio actually coming up with a real solution. Third, like I mentioned, offsets rapidly becoming important, the dollars and importance. So a recommendation is raise, the raise visibility and think of offsets as an opportunity, not a risk, because it's part of doing business. F uh, fourth would be the offset authorities. These are the economic development. Um, they have economic development goals in countries. Uh, they need to be trained as well. They're also having a tough time while the US and European companies are the supply side. On the demand side, they don't know how to discharge obligations in a way that's producing economic development. They need to be educated and trained better. And finally, I'll leave you with a point on just building a global organization. You know, US companies, European companies, US in particular, have the biggest market in the world by far, obviously. So in a way, doing business internationally hasn't really been needed. There's FMS, of, FMS, of course. But this, where this is going to sell more internationally requires operating more like a global organization. This means integrating strategy, policy, compliance, the branding, all these pieces together as opposed to being in silos, which has been typically the approach. So there's a lot of change going on here. The reason we have such a turnout on a Friday afternoon on a hot day is because this is a top of mind issue for a lot of companies and certainly from a policy standpoint. So a lot to be done and look forward to questions. Thank you, John. That was a, a good uh, overview, and, and uh, I, I like it also because there's actually some data in there that we can uh, track back to. Um, you know, the, the offset issue alone is a, a very powerful question, both from the point of view of generating as part, at the deal and then executing uh, upon signing. Companies clearly have to think about this, uh, um, the information you've laid out from their own perspective. So, David, I wonder if you might be able to shed some light on how they might approach that. Thanks, David. Um, I did not bring slides, which I guess makes me a pariah in the uh, consulting community it's, it's from, okay. we forgive you. from this point on. Okay. You have your consulting cards still. I do, I do. Anyway, uh, I just want to make a couple of, to David's comment, I'm going to make a couple of comments about how uh, some of the things we've seen in working with companies that are getting more and more involved uh, going overseas. This is primarily in our work helping U.S. primes 
uh, and the Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers that, that look at these markets in particular over the past two or three years. To John's point, um, suddenly it, it, it's back in vogue. In, in, in the strategy discussions, uh, there was a, a guy from actually I think it was BA Systems who told me uh, in the, in 2004, no one's going to return my no one's returning my phone calls. He was a VP of uh, international sales. He, he couldn't get anybody's attention. Uh, today he's a he's a popular guy. Uh, so anyway, but I just want to give a few framing thoughts about how we're looking at it. Um, for starters. Uh, Again, a little bit different take, but again, and to agree with uh, John, when you talk about international, we're really talking about 25 to 30 countries. I think you had 38. I counted quickly. It's in that neighborhood. Um, these are Europe, NATO, Persian Gulf allies, India, Brazil, a few Latin American countries, and some East Asian allies. Um, these are uh, these are people basically with real threats, real money, or both. Uh, the, the rest of the 200 countries in the world fall somewhere outside of that group when you're talking about strategy for an aerospace and defense company. Uh, we bucket them a little differently, not by size, but by how I think we need to approach them. One is a group that we would call customer nations, and by that I'm talking about people that, that tend to buy more straight up FMS or direct commercial sales, people that want real capability at reasonable prices, people that have fairly strong alliance interests, either with the US or Europe. Uh, they probably don't have much indigenous defense industry. Um, offsets are usually not the driver. There may be a consideration, but they're usually not the driver of these defense deals. And we're often, historically, it's been the Persian Gulf allies and a few uh, European nations, but everybody's moving, to your point, John. Offsets are becoming a bigger issue for everybody. The other group, which is, growing is what, what I call the partner nations. These are the biggest offset users. These are the usually the um, emerging defense, uh, the emerging companies, countries with defense needs that are, can be real, but can also be uh, to match their growing economic size, not necessarily because they have a threat on their border. Uh, they're often using offsets to uh, they haven't established aerospace and defense industry. They're using it to grow it. They're often using offsets to grow their airspace uh, and their broader technical base. They're often using offsets to work share. They're more interested in work share and tech transfer. Uh, in some cases, that trumps system capabilities or alliance considerations. Uh, and in key issues from a U.S. defense supplier perspective on this group are legality, of course, and this is something we all talk about, which is uh, will U.S. export regulations allow them to sell or transfer what the buyer wants? In some cases, the answer is just flat out no. So that's taken the U.S. defense players off the field. Uh, and then operationally, uh, and this is an issue we spend a lot of time on internally, is can the buyer absorb the work and the technology they're asking for? In some cases, the answer is yes. In some cases, the answer is not really. Um, and that is an issue that is uh, not insignificant. And these are often the larger emerging companies, countries, like I said, some East European and some East Asian allies. And the last group is the developed group. Uh, they're, they use offsets as a group, but they're trending away from them. Hi they have highly developed defense industries, but instead of trying to grow them, they're trying to save them. Uh, may have significant but declining or flat budgets, and they're more interested in co-development to keep their R&D businesses alive or they're interested in co-production or industrial capability for jobs reasons. Alliances are important, obviously. Interoperability is important to these folks. Uh, what we're seeing here, and these are the groups that you read about with the ministers of defense and the minister of finance talking about value for money and um, sustainable positions on long-term international programs. A little bit different than trying to uh, extract concessions out of, out of defense or Western uh, defense companies. And then over time, some of these folks change position, but they, um, they, um, it's important when you look at them to know where they've been and where they're going. Uh, a couple other quick thoughts. One, the laws of economics apply even to defense offsets. Ultimately, the buyer country pays for the cost of the offsets. Uh, sometimes you've got to get creative about this, but they do pay. Uh, most of the defense companies, particularly U.S. defense companies, are profit-seeking firms. 
They're not going to knowingly do uneconomic deals. Uh, offsets provided are not cash paid. Buyers use offsets for domestic political purposes, which they often need and, and, and to grow their um, both the defense industry and their broader technology regimes. But again, uh, just because you see somewhere that there's 100% offset on a project does not mean the contractor is paying mm -hmm. the uh, country to take their goods. Uh, offset costs are included in the bids, although they're not spelled out. And I think this is a problem you guys have trying to collect these data. Mm -hmm. it, it is hard to carve that out because um, we've looked at it too and we, we, we struggle with that as well. Uh, the the um, FMS regulations do not require disclosure as a line item of what the offset costs are. So you know they're buried in there, but it's not spelled out. Um, it, there's a corollary to this, which means if buyer countries realize that they could get lower pricing on defense articles and services if they didn't require offsets, uh, some of them make that trade. That's not the trend, though. The trend is more offsets. The magic is in the credit multipliers. If you can get a 10 to 1 credit for a multiplier versus dollars expended, that's a good deal. Sometimes you can get 20 to 1. It depends on how bad the host country wants whatever it is, the particular offset you want. Um, there's no international standards, so it's whatever you can negotiate. And that's why it's an art and not a science. And it's probably going to remain an art and not a science for the foreseeable future. Um, it's a blessing and a curse in, in uh, two more broad categories. One, they're a blessing and a curse. Positives are it's a marketing tool. Both the U.S. and the, the foreign uh, defense companies know how to, have learned how to use them, some of them very well. Um, I don't think that's going to go away. Um, U.S. companies in particular, have, I think, bring a lot to the table in terms of access to the range of offsets that they can uh, off, offset, uh, the way they can discharge their offset obligations, but also to uh, access to larger business networks, both in the U.S. and, and worldwide. Um, the subsidiaries, JVs, and suppliers that they create through the offsets can be part of their global supply chain. And having a landed presence, again, to John's point, is not a bad thing. Um, negatives, though, and this is where we also get stuck in, in a group, is uh, they create competitors if not immediately, in the mid to long term. Uh, U.S. export restrictions I've already talked about. And some of the management problems, we've been uh, seeing a lot of this lately. Uh, not having one responsible party for an offset obligation. Sometimes the program manager in the business unit is handling the direct uh, offset obligations. The indirects are all handed by some corporate group who's not necessarily talking to the program manager in the business unit that's handling that contract. Uh, so you, there's a disconnect. No one is responsible for, or more importantly, incentivized to uh, make sure that the total offset was worked off. Purchasing incentives get conflicted. This is an operations issue. If you're a purchasing manager, you're paid to get a certain part or a supplier that can provide a certain part at a certain price with reliability and a certain quality level and not for the maximum offset credit. Usually, if um, you go in and say, okay, uh, you, we understand what you're doing, but now we want you to take out the group of suppliers and just hire this other local country because we're going to get 20 to 1 offset credits. But they don't qualify, they don't satisfy any of the major procurement guidelines that, that this guy's evaluated on at the end of the year. So you get some friction. Uh, time phasing of offsets are, are, are an issue uh, because what's offset discussions in the early part of the procurement cycle may be very different by the time the contract's gotten signed and some of these contracts for large um, programs can be very long, can be years as you're following the fighter competitions in India and in uh, Brazil and in South Korea. Those are taking half a decade more in that range. So, um, and the last thing is defense firms are not always good at non-direct offsets. They, um, there's a lot of horror stories of uh, Polish hams and shrimp farms in the desert and vacuum cleaners and shoes and anybody that's been on this for a while has been watching these. You can, you can come up with an ex example of what's gone wrong on an indirect offset deal. And the last thing is there's uh, relatively two newer models for discharging offsets. One's a civil military uh, trade-off and you have to have a military business to play this game. Boeing. Sikorsky, some of the tier one, tier two guys that do have both civil and military business lines can sometimes use civil work to offset military um, work and vice versa. 
Um, the other option is to try to sell offset liabilities to somebody else. And this is always going to be an indirect offset issue. But uh, it seems non-defense companies are better at non-defense businesses. On its face, that's reasonable. Uh, in the case of an entity, in this case, an entity would buy the contract's indirect offset liability at a discount and take some responsibility for executing it. You need a financial player to foot some of the bill for that. And then, but the crucial stumbling blocks are uh, you have to get the buying country to formally release the defense contractor from its indirect offset liability uh, responsibility. And that doesn't always happen because that loses the uh, country's leverage over the contractor to get the uh, offsets worked off and then assigning responsibility for penalties. So in the end, uh, these are, offsets are going to be used, going to continue to be used by buyers for political, economic development and social uh, ends. Uh, they're going to be used by sellers for competitive marketing reasons. And, and if managed well and w in the case of the U.S. with some thoughtful and timely reforms by the existing export, by the government for uh, export trade restrictions, the U.S. airspace and defense companies can use offsets to their advantage, particularly to the partner nations I talked about earlier. There's lots to talk about. I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, David. That was, that was a good um, summary of a, a lot of key points, if you will. I gather um, it's your feeling that a, a company actually can market as a, as a part of its marketing scheme its ability to, to manage offsets effectively. Um, we've talked so far about this whole dynamic, though, as if it's largely an exchange between U.S. companies and perhaps their global competitors and the markets, that is, the buyers among those 36 or 38 countries that were on the screen there. Um, but there's clearly a third major player in this dynamic, and that's the U.S. government and the Defense Department itself. Uh, Jim, you've looked at this from both sides of, of that uh, dynamic, both uh, on the outside now for a company and, and previously on the inside for, uh, for DOD. Um, help us round out this discussion and maybe uh, uh, bring those players into it as well a bit. Hey, first off, uh uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here today and to ho hopefully share something of value. I, I can see all of y'all moving to the edge of y'all's chair uh, as y'all wait with bated breath about what I'm going to say here. Hey, there's a, uh, this whole thing about offsets is kind of interesting. Uh, all you have to do is read an article that there's going to be more people in this world than there are going to be jobs in about the next 20, 25 years. So that's why offsets become such a big deal because everybody wants to have an employed population. We're no different. H how many of y'all have had an opportunity to travel to some place like Afghanistan, Yemen? Y'all must have taken a vacation there, I'm sure, so. Um, so. It's part of the offset deal. Yeah, part of the offset deal, yeah. <laughs> Tourism. So, do y'all who raised your hand and y'all said y'all were in the industry, how many of y'all are in, in, in international sales? It, raise a hand with pride, yes. Hey, if so, let me just kind of lay this out sort of in a perspective. Uh, and, and I don't pretend to have any uh, great knowledge and background in this, but if doing international sales is like doing a 12 star Sudoku, all right, all you have to do is grab a hold of what offsets is and understand that is one other variable now that you have to take into consideration, a different set of laws, different culture. I mean, it just goes right on down. And it's not, it's a fact bearing on the problem. And so what I want to do today is, is just the things that I have garnered over the past several years in working with L3. I had an opportunity to work in the building. Some of the people that I had a very wonderful chance to work in the building or in the audience today, and, and they're great friends and, and all. Uh, if anybody here is from Denmark, would, would you ask him to lead, please? No. He's a friend, that's all. He... So, okay. How many of y'all have seen the defense acquisition mother of all, defense acquisition university's mother of all slides? It, it's about 20 megabytes of information it's about 20 years of, not of effort, but of 20 years of process on one chart. It could cover a wall. It's, it's a mosaic. If you have it, um, I, I don't have slides today. I'm going to use John's. No, I'm not. But 
uh, if I'm going to have charts afterwards. You need to take a look at this. And if I could leave you with anything today, it's about what industry needs in foreign military sales or foreign sales is predictability and it needs transparency. You know, well, those are the two key words here. And those should be how we measure the effectiveness of anything that we're trying to do. And why I ask about whether you're in industry and about whether you are in uh, foreign sales, the first two hurdles that we go through in a gated decision is an interest, no interest, and a pursue, no pursue decision. And the level of detailed information that you have got to have, all right, for those kinds of decisions is readily available when you understand the Defense Acquisition University's chart. So at the top is a thing called the JSIDS process. Basically, it's how we build and define a requirement. You with me? Right at the top. Right down below it is about the acquisition process. And as you go through these uh, acquisition decisions that lay out in a decision memorandum that we have done together, some of us, and then at the bottom of it is this wonderful process that just makes people so happy is the budgetary process. Requirements, the people that build the print, and at the bottom, the people that provide the money. All right? Now, so to simplify that chart, what happens is that at the top, every service has an architect for the future. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. And you generally, in the U.S. government, have somebody that fills that role. Now, they might not be very robust in their size, but they're wonderful professionals who try dramatically to do a good job. Inside the acquisition process is a wonderful acquisition, very professional. And while we might want to sometimes critique them and how well they perform, when you compare them to some of the people that you deal with internationally, and I'm not saying that they are not professional, they are better trained here in this country. And at the bottom, you might not like the process that we go through with the budget, but guess what? You get to see in business the money seven years out. So think about that. So that's this process that we live with, and in L3, for example, we are slightly above 70% of our businesses with who? DOD. We jump up towards 80% when we get the U.S. government in there. So that's what you, what you see. And why do I bring this? Because there's a predictability and a transparency. The architects of the future are basically telling you where they are investing their, IR, their, uh, their RDT and E dollars. So you can see it. So you can, industry can make that decision about whether you're interested in pursuing, excuse me, you're interested in that you want to pursue it. You with me? Some nonverbal feedback would be great. All right, that's good. Okay. So now, let's walk into international sales. When you start dealing with an international customer, do they have people that have this defining of the requirement? They probably do. Are they as professionally trained? Probably not. Do you have an, a, a very professional, the depth that you have in a material command that manages life cycle of a, of a product? Not in every case. And nobody, what I want to witness here today, is nobody would want our budgetary process either, but we've got one. And, but again, it allows you the visibility, the transparency to see a requirement coming your way. In the case of when you're budgeting with international partners, most of them, a lot of them, especially some of those that are perhaps what the term was legacy here, they have a process that allows us to see it. And that's why when you look at most of us large, and, and L3 is number six uh, domestically, when you look at your large defense contractors, who do we do business with? About 25. They command better than 70% of what we do in L3. And a lot of them, some of them are in the audience, and that's why I, I joked about uh, Denmark, because they're one of our uh, uh, customers here in a, in a nice way. And so that's why I'm framing for you then this acquisition process. And then when you go internationally, 
So then you walk that back in. So let's talk about export reform. You know, if you want predictability, if you want to, des if you want to design exportability in, then design it in approaching milestone B. Get it where we can make a decision that we're going to now be able to invest research and development dollars in this process so that what we can do is we can get certainty so that now we don't have to worry about whether there is going to be, when we petition in order to now see if something is in the national disclosure policy, is okay for us to now transfer the technology, we can start marketing that product right up front. It's a little bit like what we do with JSF. And so that's kind of a model for this. And so then let's walk into the transparency piece. So downrange, I mean, the embassies that I've touched, whether it was when I was in uniform or those that I've touched now when I have to worry about whether my sock color matches my suit, all right? What happens is, is that they are, they are wonderful professionals downrange, whether they're in defense, uh, uh, defense cooperation or whether they're in the commercial services of commerce or it's the embassy staff themselves. They are all exceedingly helpful, but they have knowledge. And they know what it, basically what it is that they want. That ambassador knows what the capabilities are that he wants that country to have. Well, how do you find out? You've got to go visit. That's one way. But there's no promulgating of that information from inside of that embassy through a combatant command that then lays out in a document form. Now, this is perhaps utopia, you're saying, but I'm just now beginning to lay out a process that we need to now be moving towards. Now, there are people who understand this, and I applaud what the combatant commanders are doing. I'm just going to mention two that I know specifically. One is the PACOM. What do they do once a year? They make you come to Hawaii, and they bring their SCOs in, their security cooperations officer and they began an interaction. Now, that's about the best we can do, all right? That's about the best we can do. And it's, and it's replicated also across some of the other commands. I know that Central Command, for example, they, uh, under uh, General Mattis specifically, what they did is they formed an FMS section in order to facilitate foreign military sales in order to now begin to help build the partner capacity. And so, as you step back, in a larger sense for us, when you look at that Defense Acquisition University chart, and you see the requirement that's built years out, if that knowledge is somewhere, how does it get to you in industry? L3 is a, uh, is a company that has over 80 companies, we are 120 profit loss centers, and we deal in 155 countries. And so the ability to know what's going on in that, that the dots that was presented by John, it becomes problematic. There's not a process that then brings it up to us that says, this is where we would like for y'all to build partner capacity. You find out when, once you petition, and whether they grant you permissions to transfer that technology or not. Now, perhaps y'all are saying I'm looking at the, the glass half, uh, half full that, or the half, uh, half empty. And so I say maybe. But if you want to now begin to move this in a way that it facilitates industry to build partner capacity, which is part of the national security strategy, then those are the things you need to do. And once again, I hit one time, one time more. Allow us to find out earlier in the acquisition process if you're going to allow us to market a technology uh, and export it. That's all I got. Thanks. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Jim. And uh, I think the powerful role of the Defense Department and of both the requirements, the acquisition cycle, and the budget. I'm going to actually uh, move, I think, to this chart of yours, John. Uh, for those of you on the web, uh, it's a short chart that shows essentially the DOD budget probably flat, perhaps less, fl less than flat going forward, depending on which scenario you want to follow. And the 
cumulative defense spending of the rest of the world going up. Now that's a bit lumpy. Not every country is going up the same. And uh, we here at, at CSIS put out a number of, of reports documenting that and looking at the trends and the breakdowns of those data. But um, um, you know, what it implies from the point of view of the company, and I'd like to ask a question, this question of each of you, uh, on the left side of that chart, the U.S. Defense Department, it's pretty hard right now to get clear demand signals from the department of what they're going to be spending their money on. We have, on the one hand, a, a president's budget and a future year defense program uh, associated with that budget. It's up on the Hill for review now. We have a Senate budget resolution, a House budget resolution, very consistent with that number, at least for fiscal year 14, starts to deviate in the out years. But none of those numbers are compliant with the statute and the Budget Control Act caps. In fact, they're off by roughly $300 billion. It's hard to get demand signals with any clarity with that level of variation and variability, um, and particularly given that the vast majority of those cuts, a disproportionately large section of those cuts, will come in the investment accounts in procurement and research and development. We sort of know that, even though we don't know exactly how this is going to play out. So it's true that for domestic sales, demand signals are hard to come by. Um, it may also be true, though, for foreign sales. And I, I guess, what does industry look for in the absence of those clear demand signals? Uh, to what do they pay attention? And uh, you can go in any order, but uh, I'd like each of you to kind of comment on what you think industry should be looking for in the absence of these clear demand signals. David, do you want to go first? You're writing, so I'm, I'll buy you time. <laughs> no, you I don't really want to go first. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that I think you do is you, you show up with what you have and figure out where's, where are you allowed to sell it and where, um, where have you maybe not focused before. Some companies have been much better at keeping boots on the ground and their international business um, as, as a priority. Uh, they all slacked off in the last decade, but they've all, to different degrees, uh, with one notable exception, um, come back to the table and trying to do more internationally. What do they look for? Um, we're talking about from international, yes, David? Yes. Yeah, not, not U.S. Right, yeah, we'll do U.S. another day. That'll be another day. Um, you know, you're looking at threat. You're looking at, uh, well, who's got the money? Who's got the threat? Um, who are the powers that be that make the decisions in that country and where um, where are their needs? Sometimes you're doing a, a, a deep dive on what are their installed fleets, be it ground vehicles, be it airplanes, be it ships, whatever. Uh, it, there's usually a modernization cycle involved. Um, there's, also, there's always electronic refresh cycles involved. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, you, you, you're somewhat looking at what you have. There is, I think, a growing uh, trend toward, and it gets to that middle group, uh, or I guess um, in another slide it said the, the major countries, um, they're radically changing their defense profiles, and that's when it gets a little bit um, harder. John, uh, what do you see when you're looking at this from an analytical point of view? Yeah, sh sure. Um, I think there's probably three components to this for uh, for a company as they're looking uh, around international sales. I think it's first, I agree with uh, David, around understanding the threat, the risk, which I, I think companies actually do a pretty good job of that, you know, just by the kind of the nature of being in the aerospace and defense sector, you know, there's, I think, a, an understanding, you know, at a high level, certainly, like what the threats are, the risks. But I think there's two other com components to this where I think companies often aren't as strong as they could be. So first is understanding threats and risks. Second is around understanding really the, what the capabilities are within the country. Um, and this is not just kind of counting the number of ships, not just counting the you know, number of ground forces. It's just kind of understanding strategically how do those capabilities of a country line up with what the strategic challenges are and really doing that kind of, I call it like a gap analysis of really understanding what the gaps are. And then the third piece is I think where companies, and it's one of the points I made at the end where I think they've struggled a lot, is then understanding how do your 
as a company, your capabilities line up. And like, what's a solution? Uh, it's something we've seen repeatedly where I do think a company should understand, like sell a product, but it's actually going in with a solution and offering is saying, well, based on your com country's threats and capabilities, here's what a solution could be uh, based on what we, what we can do, as opposed to just kind of flying in, selling a product and leaving. So I think understanding, again, to come back, the threat piece, I think the companies do a pretty good job, but understanding the country's capabilities, but then doing a, that internal look and understanding like what do you actually have and how does that line up with what the country really needs. We hear stories and stories of just the you know, companies flying and saying, here's some stuff, you know, open up my jacket, here you wanna buy some stuff, and then leave. <laughs> and then the countries just scratch their heads saying, well, I don't know. It doesn't really line up with where, where my needs are. Um, and the, and, but the, the companies that do that well understand that. But I think if you make a generalization about the aerospace and defense sector, I think a lot of them still approach it that somewhat negative way. So I think there's an opportunity to do that analysis a little better. Jim, you actually have to wrestle with this in the day-to-day -day sense of, uh, of, your, of your job as well as in the uh, observing analytical and, and, uh, and interpretation sense. Uh, what do you look for in the absence of clear demand signals for international sales? Well, I, first off, I mean, the, the obvious is, is that, um, and I think uh, both John and Dave alluded to it, but this thing called relationship is such a, uh, it's not that it's not a big deal domestically, it is a huge deal uh, in the international community. And so this relationship here uh, with understanding uh, and so that you're not viewed as an industrial tourist is, be is become so powerfully important. So whatever uh, you do and how you approach a customer, you know, they've got to see you as, as one of them, not one of them, but, you know, you are there with them full time. So you just can't, like uh, I think, John, you had on your, you can't parachute in, yeah. all right? And so I think that becomes very, very important. So that's the obvious thing. This thing called capabilities is, is kind of a, everybody, you know, thinks they understand what it is. We in industry can be too quick uh, to market whatever it is that we have. And so the, the point is, is that we, we're cute by half because we can talk about our product, but are you, do, are you really able to talk about what is the gap, which is a short-term need that is, you know, a gap means you have a, a gap that's right in front of you. A functional need is something that you can plan towards that has a little bit more distance in it, and so. But that's that's where you have got to now build this network, and that's where you have to rely on the embassy to support you. I mean, the embassy is a wonderful source of information, both commercially and on the military side. And I'll tell you this: back here in uh, in D.C., state commerce. The, all of them. I, I deal with them. I find them uh, eager. Uh, well, eager might be. I mean, they act nice when we show up, but you know, <laughs> I, I'm assuming they act nice when we leave, also. But uh, and so and so, therefore, it's it's really understanding what it is that your customer wants. And so, if they want, you know, something that's blue, you know, do, is it Duke blue? Is it Carolina blue? Is it you no? Know, does it look like Wolfpack red to them when you walk in the door? And so, I mean, so this thing about understanding really what it is that they want, because um, I, I think that they, they go through a process, although how rudiment it is on the Ditland approach, whether it's doctrine, organization, the, you know, the, the training, the leader, all those things, I mean, uh, and the material solution, they, they go through it, but they don't have this robustness that you have with the U.S. market. And so the more you pay attention, and it, and it requires more dialogue than anything else. But there's sources of information here uh, in state, in DSCA, uh, and NIPO, uh, 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 AI, and USASEC. I mean, th these are wonderful organizations that can be a, a source of information for you, so. Thank you. Let me ask one other question, and uh, we'll open it up to the, uh, to the audience here. We've talked a lot about the U.S. government's role here. We've also talked a lot about offsets and, and the role of offsets in these deals. But let me bring those two together. Um, you know, typically, the companies are kind of on their own on the offset side of things. And I think at least one of you pointed out, we, uh, two of you pointed out, we don't really even get good data 
on, on what the deals are. And yet, in a very real way, the U.S. government and DOD have a vested interest in both the nature of the agreement and the executability of the agreement over time. How consistent is it with our foreign policy objectives? What does it do to sustain and support the defense industrial base that we need to have? Um, how does it comply with all the constraints and restrictions of everything from export controls and ITAR to, um, to the process that security cooperation uh, funds have to go through? So does the government, should the government have a different expanded or altered role in offsets? And if so, what should that be? Go ahead, John. To, to cut out, uh, just to give, to, to kind of come to like, what, why is this even coming up now? I think it's probably important to like set the stage. So offsets have been around a long time. I mean, this, this isn't something that's new that just got invented. You know, it, and again, as I think both other speakers said, the purpose is about economic development in, in countries and, and jobs, ultimately. The reason it's a big deal now where you have a convergence of companies trying to sell more internationally and making a real push, you also have countries where there is demand, they are buying, and they're also becoming just more sophisticated about it. They're looking around and you have leaders in countries who have been living outside their countries, who've been trained in Western schools and are becoming more sophisticated in terms of what they want. So the idea of a, a shrimp farm, it's not as prevalent anymore. They want actual investment and jobs and partnerships. So this gets to the question that you know, David posed is you know, why, you know, for a long time, it didn't really matter that the U.S., you know, there would be data tracked by commerce. But the difference now is that it is becoming important, and it's becoming, you know, significant for companies. It's becoming a strategic issue for companies. So, I mean, I would, I don't think I have an answer in terms of what that exact role is, but in terms of having the visibility around offsets and what it's going to mean, because it is affecting every company. Every time you see a statement by a CEO saying we're going to sell more internationally, offsets comes up. And as David said. Can this be a source of real economic development? Absolutely. I mean, that's the intent. So this is, I think, a, a kind of an untapped resource that somehow has managed to be inefficient for all parties. You know, the U.S. government gets little out of it. Companies get a burden out of it. And then countries where the economic development is supposed to take place are not getting the resources used either. So it's actually a perfectly bad outcome for all parties. <laughs> The, the only thought here is, David, we, uh, for instance, uh, DSCA used to require disclosure of the amount of offset costs in the bids, and that's been removed. That is no longer required. So we're going in the opposite direction. So we're going in the opposite direction. Just, just I appreciate your hypothetical, but we're going in the opposite direction. That's number one. Number two, I think this is one of those areas where um, the U.S. government has to be careful. I think you're right. They do have an interest. Uh, and, and helping direct where some of this development needs to go. But I think it needs to be very careful how it applies it, because a heavy hand here could really hose it up. Uh, and, and in some ways, um, this, this is not the first time this has come up. It came up in the 90s when same exact thing happened. Defense budgets went down, defense contractors went overseas. And it became, and that's when the gears started grinding. And, um, and that's when uh, eventually they said, we're gonna take a lighter touch. Um, hey, mine works as a sort of an operations research guy, so I, data, I would, I would, I'm, I'm attracted to data, all right? And I think that, uh, that why, why it becomes important is, is that we don't take credit, necessarily credit for it internationally, because what it is is an investment then, you know, in that country. And so I'm not trying to say then that that's something that we beat our chest on that, and that we brag about, but I think it's something that we need to now understand how we leverage uh, so that it, you know, when you hear about China and their investments uh, internationally, uh, and so are these not uh, investments also in, in countries? That's, that's the first thought. The second thought also is, is that um, uh, I was part of a, a forum and, and in the discussion was about when the U.S. invests in jobs internationally, what does it mean back to the U.S.? And it was a, it's a return, there is a return multifold from what we invest in a foreign country and what we get back because of what they buy. And so from that perspective, I think it's something that we need to understand and not look at, although it's a, it's a, um, 
it's a challenge. It's a it's a en route march to uh, a lot of bureaucracy that we go through. But how do you then take that and make it in so that it is something that shows uh, what America, you know, what the United States is doing internationally? I think th I think that's what how I'll pursue it. So. Well, you've been very patient. About got about 140, 150 people in the room here uh, for questions. We also have about 50 more on on the web. Uh, if you are on the web and uh, you'd like to uh, send a question in, you can email it uh, to me at uh, d b e r t e a u at c s i s dot o r g. If I can understand your question, I'll uh, try to ask it. Uh, we've also got a great audience here, so there, if there's some tough questions that actually we can't answer, there's a number of folks in the audience we can call on to, uh, to answer those questions as well. Who's, uh, who's got the microphones here? All right. Uh, what we'll do is uh, raise your hand. I'll uh, recognize you, and then we'll try to go in order around the room, and then we'll uh, uh, wait for the mic and identify yourself and ask a question. Let's start right down here in front, and then we'll move uh, back and then to the, to the two sides. So raise your hand again, sir, so the microphone carrier will know where to bring it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhattu. My name is Hasmuk Shah from Business Times, which has been promoting U.S. commercial interests overseas, that's very South Asia. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Anyway. <laughs> okay. Now, my question is this. Defense sales is very important for the U.S. economy. And overseas, defense sales, especially in security, energy, and defense, is the prime tool promoting U.S. exports and which will help promote uh, uh, which will help attain President Obama's objective of doubling our exports in the next two, three years. So my question is this thing. Def Recently, Secretary of State John Kerry went to India, and there was a strategic dialogue between India and USA. The most important topic discussed was defense, security, and energy, where U.S. can play a very important role in promoting bilateral relations. Now, India is keen to buy U.S. defense equipment. India, as you know, is the largest importer of defense equipment in the world. Now, but it has its own requirements that it wants some defense joint production, or te technology, other things. So can you experts let us know what are the opportunities of promoting our defense exports to India, which is a big market? Thank you. Yeah. Somebody restate the question. Yeah, I'll make sure. I think the question that I got is, uh, what, what can we do to increase exports to a country, India specifically, but I think India also represents um, a category of offsets that really looks at uh, developing domestic technology and production capacity as part of that offset equation, and uh, what what makes sense in terms of uh, export promotion uh, and and foreign military sales promotions from that perspective? Is that a fair characterization of the question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I make some, first some some industry observations. Again, a, a positive and may, maybe not so positive. Um, with India, it is without a doubt, you know, one of the markets that comes up. I think, as I mentioned, in in any discussion with a company around where to grow internationally, as I said, like these busy markets, you can see on the chart there, it is both large and expected to grow. So there's universal kind of understanding that it's a significant market. Now, there, among kind of certainly on the U.S. side, there's also there's been frustrations. I think it's getting better, particularly in the last maybe year or two with the, the visits by you know, the president, um, Under Secretary Kendall, etc. There's been a lot of um, interest in India, but the challenges they've had have been first, you know, opaque procurement processes that take a very long time. You know, you have international competition um, that's hard. There's a number of U.S. companies that have been in India for a long time without really seeing the results. Not, no one's pulling out, but they're, 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 they've just been frustrated. And a lot of this gets back to um, opaque, very, very lengthy acquisition processes. Um, but I think if you went to any major company, they would all say universally that India is a significant opportunity. So I think on the industry side, what they would like is um, just be able to have a little more visibility like 
we were, you're hearing out the comments, going out farther and understanding what is really going to be procured. Um, I heard a joke once, somebody saying India would have a $1 trillion defense budget if everything was announced, uh, that was announced actually came true. Um, and that's you know, obviously not the case. So I think if, if there was more visibility on the, and transparency, I think that would go a long way for U.S. Let's, uh, I think I saw one more in the middle here. Um, third row, two, we got one here. Raise your hand again. There we go. It, uh, David, a couple, uh, Joel Johnson, yes. at Teal Group, U.S. Crest, whatever. Um, two quick comments on, uh, on offsets and then a question. I, I think it's worth noting that industry has spent 25 years trying to keep the government out of information on offsets because the better we make an offset look to the foreign customer, the worse it looks to a domestic uh, constituent. All nine amendments we've had over 20 years from Congress have all been trying to stamp out offsets. So we've had good reason not to want the government messing around in this area because it's, it's a lose-lose for industry generally. And, and secondly, I think the trend on, on offsets, you started out as a way to gain currency in the 70s, that was the Swiss chocolates and the Danish hams, then it was essentially jobs and tech, then it was essentially a way to convince parliaments to let them spend the money to buy the foreign uh, 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 product. And more recently what you've seen is offset uh, management being turned over to development ministries and economics ministries who could care less about the weapon system. Right. Right. And, and so part of our problem now, you know, if you want to hire a consultant, go get Fleur or Bechtel, don't get Lockheed Martin to tell you how to do shrimp farms. But you've got a, uh, this tension now that we have to deal with, I think, among our customer base between the guys that care about development and the guys that care about having a weapon system that works. So anyway, enough of that. What I've, I've been through, this is the third buy, that build down I've been through, and of course each time if you were to add the, the must-win contracts of U.S. industry, it will be more than global demand, not even counting the must-wins for the European competitors. We don't talk very much about the competitors in all of this, and no one's even mentioned them today. You know, what do you have to know about what the French are offering? What do you know about the British are offering? What do you have to know about what your other companies are offering? What are the implications that are coming up now for bribery, worse offsets, more shenanigans? Because it's going to, be, you know, this is, this is real tough stuff that's going to be happening. And, you know, the, the demand is going to depend on threat and, and resources. There's a lot more supply than there is demand. <laughs> and so I think we need to take a look at what are the implications of our foreign relations with our European friends, relations within even agencies of the U.S. government who might favor Boeing versus Lockheed Martin on a fighter program for very good reason. Each of them want to keep their industrial base alive. So we haven't looked at any of that part of this in all of the articles I've read on, on um, defense exports and the need for them to look at the supply side as opposed to the demand side. Well, assuming we agree with that, is your question, do we agree with that? Or? Yeah, yeah, and, and, you know, and what, <laughs> what, what should we be looking for in terms of right. what, what the implications are for our relations with our European colleagues, with some of the, third, the Israelis, others that are all doing the same kind of meetings right, right now. Thank you, Joel. I mean, I, I think you've actually got two very different but very well closely connected questions there. Um, one is, how do we look at the, the competition, if you will, and, and not only the countries you mentioned, but, uh, but obviously, uh, to a very large extent, uh, Russia and China are part of our competition now in ways that they were not before. And while we may, for U.S. national security purposes, want our companies to view those uh, competitors in a non-potential collaboration way. Not all of our global competitors view either China or Russia as a non-collaborative, uh, as a non-opportunity for collaboration. Many of them see a very different line in that regard. I think it's a much more complicated uh, overall business dynamic and national security dynamic than, than uh, you know, you mentioned early on, this is your third time. I'm pretty sure it's your last one uh, because this one's going to last long enough that we're not going to see a, a fourth. But uh, uh, at least those of us uh, of our generation. But, uh, but, but it is a very different complexity, I think, in terms of, uh, of both the global dynamic and, and the global market. Um, and so uh, let me pose to our panel, you know, uh, sort of observations you might make of how we think about the competition and how we think about the potential collaboration amongst our competition as well. I'll, ta I'll take this one. 
unless you want to. Um, well, all right. My only quite thought about competition. If you get it right, I'll just agree with you then. <laughs> yes. I think I'm guaranteed to get it wrong then, right? Um, the competition is going to get worse. It's already getting worse. But the one thing, there's a couple of the counter trends, I think, Joel. One of them is, it's interesting, um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act started here in the United States. But it's been, it, you, if you watch the last 10 years, the Serious Fraud Office in the UK, checking out things that happened 10 years ago in Saudi Arabia, even what's going on in, in Mechanica uh, in, uh, in their dealings with India, the fact that they would take the CEO and put him in jail means that some of the ethics of doing business, at least in the Western countries, is actually spreading. Now, not everybody's on the same page, I agree. But it's, it's a general trend that I think is going on there. Um, the other issue, I think, is when you're talking about Russia and China, which are an interesting and important case, depending on the, the system you're talking about, it's going to have to do with can they keep, there's still a, a defense, as long as there's a def as long as somebody is in the loop that cares about defense, they don't have the level of equipment yet to compete with most of the U.S. systems and even, I'd argue, most of the uh, European and Israeli systems. They may get there in the next 10 years, but I don't think they're there today. You can argue with certain examples saying, hey, they just, we just went to the Paris Air Show and saw the, F, the SU-35 fighter. It looks pretty good. Um, most of the um, U.S. and most of the Europeans will say, yeah, but it doesn't matter because they're not going to sell any to us. They're going to sell them to people that may not even be on this chart uh, or at the lower end of the chart. So it's a different context. They're going to play. They're going to be in the market. They're going to, uh, they don't have the technology ability to, to compete yet. Um, they do play the development game pretty well, though. And the Chinese in particular are really getting really good at that. And so that's going to be, that's going to be stiff going forward. Hey, one quick comment, because uh, as I listen to you speak, and I, and I accept the, the critique about not mentioning the competitors, but that is part of your interest, no interest decision. I mean, that is, that is what that is. You have to understand who you are about to compete against, because while you assess a P-GO opportunity, which would be my comment to the gentleman about India, yeah, is, is about, it also gets into P-WIN. You've got to decide whether you can compete or not. And so the issue gets to be, as I, as I listen to this and I try to discern a larger issue out of this, is, is that so if, if, if it's an industrial base, defense industrial base issue, as I, as I would describe it, where do you want to be strong, U.S.? Where do you want to now have a capability where you cannot, where you have overmatch and you want to continue to have it? Or do you want to allow that to be competed so that it is then something that you rely on an ally. But do we have an, indust an industrial base, uh, defense industrial base policy that is well enough defined so that it allows those kind of decisions to be made about what you are or are not going to tech transfer? Um, I, I would say maybe not. And so as we begin to define then, let's broaden that because how do you define the readiness of the defense industrial base? One last piece of information. Hey, here's the deal. Why, why were we able to transform our armed forces after 2003 when we went into Iraq and transform it over a period of about three years? It was because of our defense industrial base. Because we had a defense industrial base that was able to, it had a depth and capacity, it had an intellectual component that allowed us to change the, uh, the vector of our armed forces on the ground, how we fought, the kinds of ways we used our munitions and, and, and our armaments. And so it wasn't all of a sudden somebody over here at the Pentagon that made these decisions, but it was able to then be manifested out of a defense industrial base that had the agility. And so do you want to have that for the next conflict? Because it's not about whether there will be one. There will be, and how good are we going to be? We right now have the best armed forces in the world. And so do we want to keep it that way? And so I get back to the industrial base issue when you start the discussion about the competitors. Because when, when you're downrange, I'll tell you what, you see a heck of a lot of French. You see a heck of a lot of Europeans. When you go to IDEX, you know, I mean, you know, not U.S. shows, but not in the ways that others do internationally. 
How many of y'all went to IDEX? Okay. Well, I could be lying. Y'all wouldn't know. So. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just th three three quick points. First, agree with uh, G General on boots on the ground. That's a big difference between U.S. and European firms. The U.S. has not do it, done it historically. Second is that companies in general don't really, I think, understand who the international competitors are. I mean, I've sat in meetings, and typically they take a very narrow view. So I think understanding the broad landscape, both with U.S. firms, European firms, and international firms, and who are actually your competitors, what's the landscape, is critical. Then third is understanding who your partners are, too, because sometimes a competitor, of course, can be a partner. And this is particularly true in markets that involve offsets, and for a reason. We, we didn't bring this up. I think this is, a, again, an important point, is that if you are doing an offset, um, you make a sale in the UAE or Saudi Arabia or Brazil or India, you need to have a local partner. So understanding who the local partners really are, what they can bring to you, um, not just from, you know, from, from a compliance standpoint, but what business capabilities do they bring? I think companies often kind of neglect that part of it because doing business in any of these markets um, often involves a local partner. Understanding the JV partners is critical. Those are all uh, good key points. Let me, I, they had a number of questions here on the side. Uh, let me go to the, to the uh, middle of the third row here, and then we'll work our way forward. We've actually got about 40 questions, and so I'm going to try to ask our questioners to keep your questions succinct, and I'll ask our panel to do the same with our responses so we can maximize the input here. Hi, so Steve Schooner at the George Washington University. First uh, comment and then a question. Interesting in the discussion of offsets, what I didn't hear anyone talking about is what may be one of the more interesting developments to watch on this is that the World Trade Organization's government procurement agreement now prohibits offsets. Now, of course, it excludes defense and it excludes some of the players like India, but for the first time we have something akin to an internationally binding agreement among all of the major trading partners that we're opposed to offsets. Now, nobody believes it and nobody abides by it, but it's a different rubric or benchmark than we've had in the past. Um, the other one, I've been very, very impressed by the conversation, really enjoy it. This is a very friendly group as we look around to our panelists. Let's just change the perspective for a second. Since we're at CSIS and not NDIA or AIA or something like that, my question's kind of on DOD leadership, okay? So, you know, if you've been reading David and his group studies, what we see is a lot of these partners on this chart, they're decreasing their defense spend faster than we are. So our solution is we're going to sell more of our stuff to them. They're spending less stuff as well. But one of the real questions are, going particularly back to the general's questions as we look at the world, should our Defense Department be tactically thinking about which allies they should be encouraged to buy which weapons? There is, at the end of the day, we're talking about exporting power. And to the extent that the rhetoric from the Defense Department is, as we spend less, we'll rely on our allies more. Our allies aren't spending money. Should we have some tactical leadership with regard to integrating this discussion rather than just letting the private industry or, in fact, the supply side be driving the discussion? Uh, Steve, thank you. That was a very provocative question, and I, I don't feel like it's a friendly audience at all. Um, no. Uh, in, in reality, uh, let me make uh, uh, three observations and then ask the panel to I expand on it. I mean, clearly, uh, the, the companies don't really want guidance from DOD as to who can sell what to whom, all right? And, and actually, I'm not sure that the government is smart enough to be able to make business decisions for business. Um, if they were, we probably wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. But, uh, but uh, it is also true that there are national security interests at stake here, and they're, they're uh, complex and, and uh, deep and abiding, both in terms of their uh, uh, temporal nature and in terms of, of their importance. Um, and and it, it is very useful to bring those national security interests. And, and it should not be up to the companies to determine what those national security interests are. That is clearly an inherently governmental function, even though it's not included in the definition of inherently governmental functions by the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. Um, but then there's a third dynamic, really, which is the, the money. All right. And while it's true that there are a number of uh, dots on this chart that uh, those of you at home can't see, but uh, the major and, and, uh, and legacy customers uh, whose budgets are going down, there are also a couple of pretty substantial regions of the world that spend a pretty good bit of money where they're going up. 
I mean, our, our Asia study shows that, uh, you know, uh, defense spending in Asia is, is roughly doubling uh, every five years, and we fully expect that trend to continue. Um, and that's a new and, and very competitive market, but it's also one in which determining exactly what our national security interests are a little bit harder than they were in the Cold War in, in Europe and NATO, uh, and maybe harder than they are in the Middle East, although that's getting a little, little more difficult as well. So. Wrestling with all three of those together, I think we see a, a situation in which the companies do have an important role to play. That has a lot more to do with, with technology and the execution and the individual deals. The government clearly has a role to play in terms of the aggregate. How you mesh those two, I don't think we have a good mechanism in place for that right now. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm a little concerned that the outcomes may not be optimal. But I'm equally concerned about the creation of any kind of a framework in which it would take even longer to figure out what to do. And, uh, and we'd end up e essentially losing out uh, to our competition al almost across the board and gaining neither a national security benefit nor a domestic industrial base or technology benefit and ultimately sacrificing all of that. That's a long-winded answer to when I said I wanted succinct. But, uh, but I think as a, it's a pretty important question. It really is the overarching issue that, uh, that frames everything that we're talking about here today. Anybody want to add anything to that? Yes. <laughs> no, not, not to be. But I, I, first off, it's a great question. And, and you said it much better than in what I was trying to portray. Um, I, I think that w we do want, if, if you have as a, as a platform of your strategy to build partner capacity, then it pretends then that you have a process that tells you. And so, I mean, in a process-oriented world, then you would have this. We have, we have the elements there, but how do you now get them so that they are integrated so that you can go from an embassy in the middle of Latvia, wherever, and then bring that information in a holistic way? It's hard. It, it is hard. And I know that DSCA, uh, both uh, Emma Lande and uh, Dick Janiel, they, they have been working that issue. But that is a monstrous issue, and that is a course change from how we have done that in the past. And so, but let's, let, let's make that then sort of an orienting vector about how we want to proceed in the future. And I think, that, I think that's what government wants to do. But I don't see necessarily how we are correcting that. So, um, let's go to the. Hi, uh, my name is Bernie Lee. I'm a graduate student at Seton Hall University. Uh, my question is about um, kind of the uh, the end user situation that you guys have been putting forward here. Um, it's you know about f who who's buying these systems, the defense systems. So a couple questions uh, that kind of relate to each other is, um, there's a number of issues that uh, a lot of foreign countries see with uh, investor state arbitration issues that the US is a hard, uh, that US firms are hard to deal with when they, when they uh, deal with the state. Um, and then also do these foreign states understand at a very granular level, granular level their uh, security needs. Maybe that they're, maybe they're being vague because they just really don't understand how to create the systems that there are. So this, my question then goes to, can, these, can US firms, I mean, the defense contractors, the, the, other, uh, the contractors that uh, do other sorts of systems and energy and so forth, work, collaborate, creating more complex systems that can be offered up and changed around based upon a number of co uh, coordinated um, strategic ventures um, between U.S. firms to meet the needs of these foreign, uh, foreign states. This also would spread the risk uh, to, separate, uh, to many U.S. companies and then maybe make it more effective to market these products to the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, so the answer is yes. I, I think that U.S. firms, I put up there as a comment, uh, they, they absolutely can help shape it. I think this goes back to the idea of offering a solution instead of a product. You know, we, I've seen a number of cases where a country will come to a U.S. firm saying, you know, I have this challenge. Help me think through what I need to do because, you know, you've, you've done a similar solution in three other countries. Uh, I think a challenge for U.S. firms has been to think that way and to be proactive as opposed to saying, here's my... 10 products I could sell you, um, and just kind of stepping back and saying, like, here's an actual solution. So I, I think there's a, there's a big opportunity there to help shape it um, from start to finish. And I think countries in, in general would really kind of welcome that. Um, Sandra, here's your mic. Thank you very much. 
I had a question for the general. Um, you might tell everybody else who you are, even though yes, I know who I'm you sorry. are. Yes, I'm sorry. Sandra Irwin <laughs> with National Defense Magazine. Uh, General, uh, I don't know if you saw a study that came out uh, from Deloitte recently talking about the global defense market, and they were saying that the trends are shifting more to low-intensity conflict and special operations, and, and that's what's going to drive the market. I was just wondering how you see that playing into the international sales for U.S. firms. I mean, what are the products that are going to be in high demand? I'll defer to John here. No. Yeah. You know, it's, it's sort of an interesting question. I'll tell you a little, uh, I'll tell you, I'll start off with the tail, all right? It, so we, we are trying to expand the national train, we were trying to expand the National Training Center back in the 1990s, all right? The National Training Center is out at Fort, Fort Irwin, California. And we were trying to add to it. But the problem is, is that you had uh, two, um, uh, you had a, um, the desert tortoise, which was becoming extinct. And you had another pro and you had a, a vegetation call, I think it was like milk veg or something like that was that was also becoming extinct out there. And the problem was is that we could not, we had to be careful about uh, this, the these animals becoming extinct or the vegetation becoming extinct. And so I was dealing with the Department of Interior. So I got asked, why, why, and this was in 1998, why would you ever want to now extend what was the maneuver zone. We were trying to maneuver for 50 miles, 50 miles. And, and, and if y'all have ever been to Fort Irwin, it's a huge place. It's in, next to Death Valley, all right? I mean, it's not, it's, un, it's formidable. But, but and so, and, and the question was, is that because we will never fight another great land war like we did during Desert Seal and Desert Storm. Five years later, where were we? We're in Iraq. And so I, I think the question that you give is great because we need to discuss it. And so, but, um, and some people would offer that the, the kind of warfare that special ops does and the uh, insurgency warfare is really, is, while they call it asymmetrical, it is really what goes on in a normal way most of the time and you, it's episodic when you do these high intensity kind of conflicts. The problem is, is that you can't not divest yourself of that capability because it takes too long. It, 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 we wanted to grow the Army from, from 489,000, the active duty force. And we could just grow that in a period of six years. It took, a, we, we went to 547. It took forever. And so as you ask the question, I give a question back. You know, are you, are you, is it a zero-sum game? Is it about growing? Because I think the capabilities that they're talking about are very much needed for the kinds of things that we see going on. But at the other point, what I don't want to do is forfeit a capability that we have in our active duty and in reserve forces. And that balance there has to be with some foresight because we are not going to get it right when we set a strategic aiming point for how we structure the force. It'll never be at zero mills. And so, you know, that's, I'm, I'm not trying to be evasive, but you're asking for an absolute in a, in a time when you can't give it because it's, it's not gonna be right. All I know is, is that what we don't wanna do is have an armed forces that's not ready that like it was during the Korean conflict when there was, you know, a, a, a outburst and then, because we were all hoped that peace was breaking out after World War II, so. So do you think countries are going to continue to buy tanks and, and all the heavy weaponry, that, like traditional warfare? I, 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 I think that uh, General Dempsey, General Odierno, and then they will figure this out. I mean, it's not for me to second guess it. <laughs> La ladies These and gentlemen, are guys I think the world does, so. you, are, you are very generous to give us an hour and a half of your time. Uh, one of the ways in which we persuade you to come back is we actually stop when we say we're going to stop so that you can plan your schedule around it. I sort of hate to do that because there's a lot more questions and a lot more discussions. What I can commit to you is that um, this is not the last discussion we're going to have on this topic. I think uh, uh, the 
issues raised today, the complexity of the issues raised today, and the tangents that fall off from those clearly warrant uh, additional further discussion. We will be inviting you back. I want to uh, apologize to those that we didn't get to your questions. I want to thank those on the web uh, for sending questions in. We didn't get to very many of those either. Uh, and, uh, and I want to ask you to join me in thanking our panel here, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>